Hello everybody, today you join me for an early morning drive in my 1999 Ferrari 550 Maranello. A gorgeous classic V12 Ferrari that I've been lucky enough to call mine for the last two and a half years. This is a genuine childhood dream purchase of mine, but for all of you over the last year, I think everything about this car that you'll have seen is me talking about how much money it's just cost me. In fact, I recently did the maths and worked out that on average, I have spent a thousand pounds for every month that I've owned this car. And that's just in maintenance, let alone fuel and everything else. But in spite of all that, and the fact I've been lucky enough to drive a whole host of other Ferraris and even add two more to my driveway, the 550 remains one of my all-time favourites. And today I'm going to talk you through my history with this car and why, 25 years on, I still love it. the exact moment when I became aware of the 550 Maranello. The model itself launched back in 1996 and was a very big deal for Ferrari because with this car they were returning to the old formula of a front-engined two-seater V12 for their flagship model. For the two and a half decades previously, this is a job that had been taken by a mid-engined flat 12. Originally, the 365 GT4 BB, then the 512 BB and BBI, then later the infamous Testarossa. I say infamous there because although it was and is a well-loved and iconic car, those who've actually experienced them seem somewhat divided on whether they like it or not. It is a reasonably cramped thing inside, despite not being the tiniest of cars. There are some real old-school Ferrari quirks and features about it. It isn't a particularly logically laid out thing. And though I suppose, if committed, you could drive it every single day, you would require a fairly firm hand to do so. Nothing in that car is particularly user-friendly. With this, Ferrari's then boss, Luca de Montezemolo, wanted a car that could really be used every single day, with far less of the compromises often associated with a big Ferrari. Though history now views the 550 as one of the firm's greatest cars, at the time, journalists weren't quite so convinced. I think they'd grown very fond of the old mid-engine cars, and despite their flaws, really did love them. So when this came out, I believe they all thought Ferrari had just gone soft. It was going to be now just an upmarket jag, but nothing could be further from the truth. I don't think it helped that early drives in this car were on a track and from the passenger seat and neither are really where the 550 shines. Instead, it's from this seat and here, out on the open country roads. Don't forget, if any of my videos have inspired you to head into the classifieds after watching them, regardless of whether it's for a Ferrari or a Fiat, you'll need Car Vertical, the super-powered super search that cross-references a number of databases from across the globe to give you all the information on any used car purchase, including accident damage, regardless of whether a car has been written off or not, usage as a taxi, outstanding finance, information on whether a vehicle may be stolen, and even some handy hints and tips that you'll need to know when you're looking at a specific model. A car vertical report will cost you less than a tacky piece of awful carbon fibre off eBay and is far more useful. It works on both desktop and mobile and for a special discount check out my link in the description or comment section down below. It's still quick today this car and I bet it was seriously rapid way back in 1996. Remember then, a Golf GTI had about 150 horsepower, this near a 500. As with many things, it's Jeremy Clarkson that I have to blame for my lusting over a 550. It was featured in one of his annual Christmas VHS tapes, Apocalypse Clarkson. This followed on from Clarkson Unleashed on Cars, where he declared the Ferrari F355 the greatest car in the world ever. But in Apocalypse Clarkson, he declared this the best handling car in the world ever. 
How true that actually is, I don't really want to say, but what I can tell you is that even today, there really is something very, very special about the way that the 550 drives. I suppose, really, I was always doomed to have one of these as a first Ferrari if I was ever able to afford a first Ferrari. I really didn't want to be the sort of person that simply bought anything because it has a prancing horse on the front. I didn't want a four-seater. I didn't want something that was from an era that I didn't really love. For me, the 90s is the Ferrari era, thanks to that lusting of the 355 and the 550. I'd have been very happy with a 360, but Sam from Seen Through Glass has that market sewn up, and quite frankly, I've yet to see an example of a 360 that I want more than his. It was always a coupe of some description that I had my heart set on, if for no other reason than they seem to be the easiest to own, and certainly in terms of the 550 if you do want the rather rare Barchetta. Not only does it to my eyes look worse than the coupe, but it also doesn't drive anywhere near as well and is um, quite a bit more money. As I wasn't particularly set on getting a V12, a 355 certainly was an option, but one thing that was non-negotiable was the gearbox. I had to have that six-speed manual. The 550 gives me all of that. It's a coupe, a two-seater. It's the last Ferrari V12 flagship to have only a manual gearbox. More than that, all of the reports I could get my hand on told me that the steering in this was vastly better than that in the F355, the only Ferrari that I really got to experience for the first 10 years of my driving career, and I did realize it was a weak point. This also has lots of space in it, and I knew that if ever I did get to that position where I could afford a Ferrari, I'd want to use it all the time, which means that I needed one with plenty of storage in it, but also quite a few miles on the clock, because I've always been aware of how mileage sensitive these cars are, and not to put too fine a point on it, I can't just afford to throw money away by driving my car. I always knew that these were not going to be particularly cheap things to own, and I didn't want to exacerbate that by depreciating the damn thing as well. I want to enjoy my car without a fear of coming home going, hmm, that was a nice drive, only cost me a thousand pound in depreciation. Technically speaking, I could have actually bought one of these a few years earlier than I did. But back then, I knew one thing. Though I had the money to buy one of these cars, I didn't have the money to maintain one. That's one of the reasons I wound up buying my Lotus Evora. Sure, it was a somewhat problematic car, but it also didn't really cost me anything to fix because it had a warranty. A 550 or 355 or 360 wasn't gonna come so equipped. It was in late 2019, early 2020, that I've been saving for quite a while, and it finally seemed as if that Ferrari may be within reach. YouTube was actually beginning to turn a profit, which was slowly growing. With the McLaren video that I did way back in 2019, things turned really good, and I suddenly realized that not only could I just about afford a very, very ropey example of a half-decent Ferrari, but I might actually be able to afford to run it too come about February and I was in a position where I reckon I had just about enough cash to get my hands on what would have been the cheapest 550 in the country. I do apologize by the way if you can hear the maddening squeak. I don't know where that's come from. That is a new one. The car is off to Meridian once again. I'll talk about why in a little bit and uh, they'll look at that. I was about that far away from pulling the trigger on a 550 when a few things happened. First off, our friend COVID made his appearance. And that changed a lot of things, though ultimately, at that point in time, it actually did work somewhat in my favour. First off, everybody, myself included, started to get cold feet about whether buying cars like this was the right thing to do. I also was concerned about how regular my income was going to carry on being. I lost my one and only major sponsor of the channel at the time because they no longer had anything they could sell people, and why would they spend money advertising what they cannot sell? Finance companies also started panicking, though that really wasn't a concern for me because my plan was to be able to buy a car cash. At that time, I'd never financed any car at all, so I wasn't really confident that I could actually, you know, get it. So I didn't really want to count on that. 
I held off for a couple of months for things to stabilize and when it became clear that things were going to be bad for quite a while and yet they hadn't turned horrible for me, I felt comfortable enough to carry on. So I went and looked at an example of a 550 that was being advertised by the chap who owned it. He also ran a dealership and clearly specialised in cars like this, so I thought this could be a good opportunity. It sounded like a fairly honest advert. He said, look, I've had the car for a while. It's got quite a few miles on it. It was 90 odd thousand or so. It does need some help cosmetically, but mechanically it's really good, has been really well looked after. I went to go and see the car, though I can't remember if it was lockdown times, we were in one of those weird periods, so all of his stock was actually at his house. I went to go and visit it in my S2000, and that scraped the hell out of the front getting into his driveway. I wondered how on earth could you get a 550 in here if I can't even get my S2000 in safely. Turns out you can't because the car, amongst other things, had a massive crack in the front splitter, loads of damage all over the place. It was very clear to me that the photos being used of that car were vintage ones. He claimed it had only been about nine months since those photos were taken, but uh, if that was true, there were nine very hard months, I can tell you. Just about everything I looked at on that car was wrong. The check straps on the door didn't work, so I nearly dented the other 550 that he had at the house. All the front was messed up from the driveway. The dashboard was peeling apart from exposure to the sun. All the switches were sticky, but that is common 550 thing. All of the rear lights were cracked, and I knew stuff like that was not going to be cheap to do. And that's before you get onto the fact that all the paintwork was gone, the seals were bad as well. The car needed oodles of work and the clutch had at least 40,000 miles on it, which, though it may still have operated absolutely fine, that would be getting towards the end of expected life for a 550 clutch. Those are about three or 4,000 pounds, and by the time I did my maths, I thought, hang on a minute, for that kind of money, I could just buy a much better example to start off with. It also wasn't in the colour that I would have wanted. It was Grigio Silverstone with a Bordeaux interior. I have to admit, that is actually quite a good colour combination for these. It's a more understated pairing, but a grey Ferrari just isn't for me, says the man who later owned a grey Ferrari. But this was the dream, you see, and I couldn't be flexible on stuff like that. Originally, my plan actually was to totally repaint it. I figured this car's way beyond original. It's never going to be a collector's piece. I'll just muck about with it. If it needs a respray, I may as well respray it in the colour that I want. But I realised this was an example that he was asking far, far too much money for. When I later posted pictures of what the car actually looked like, he changed the photos on his website and also dropped the price to, I think, less or the same as I had offered him because I said, look, your car needs more work than you've let on and I'm happy to buy it, but I have to make adjustments for the fact that it needs a lot more than I expected. He said no and then yeah, later realised that he was not going to shift that car in that condition for the price he was asking. So, back on the hunt and I found an example being sold by a lovely chap called Nick in what was the classic Ferrari colour combo, Rosso Corsa, Cream and Bordeaux and it was a car that had lots of miles on it, over 90,000 on the clock with a fairly healthy service history. He just spent £17,000 on it and it all sounded fairly good but it was more money. I'd budgeted for sort of about 50 odd grand and this was just over 70. In fact, I think he was asking close to 80. I had actually spoken to him a few times before I went to look at the grey one and he seemed like a genuinely very helpful and enthusiastic chap. With stuff like this, if you're going to buy privately, to me, it's really, really important the person you're buying from is into the model or certainly the mark at least. And this guy was. It wasn't his only Ferrari. Anyway, on the way home, from having viewed the grey one, I spoke to my finance guy at the time, Daryl, and said to him, look, here's a car I really, really fancy. If I could get it for this price, just under 70, and I could give you the cash that I've saved already as a deposit, do you think we can make it work, even with all the finance companies not wanting to fund anything? And he said, well, we can try. So I phoned up Nick and said, look, Nick, here's my situation. I want to buy my first Ferrari. I want the right one. I'm going to drive the heck out of it. I'm going to use it. I'm going to make videos on it. I'm going to do all this stuff. But this is the budget I've got. And I know it's a lot less than you're asking. And he came back and said, you know what? Yeah, if you're really going to use it that much, go for it. Now, 
maybe he's just flattering me and all that jazz, and I'm sure that's possible, but I do tend to believe the guy. And he said, look, you know, I've been offered a little bit more, but from a dealer, and I don't want it to go to a dealer. So I bought it. Sight unseen. We managed to get the finance. We persuaded them that I chucked enough deposit at it that they said, okay, it sounds like a, a pretty safe bet. And my friend Michael took me from one side of the country to the other to go and get it. Thank you, Michael, for being part of it. I didn't film any of that day because we were still in sort of lockdown rules and I really, really didn't want to face the wrath of the comment section. We were doing everything as safely and securely as we could. We never even went into his house or anything like that. And um, the first time I actually ever drove a Ferrari 550 Marinello was away from his house after I just bought one. Not actually the first time I've done that with the car, I also did it with the Lotus Elise. Had never driven one until after I'd bought it, but the way my insurance was at the time, and of course conditions as well with COVID, there wasn't really any way it was going to be any different. I think everybody at the time telling me that buying a car in lockdown was a stupid idea, they're all gonna lose money, etc., 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 only sort of added to my determination. I had to have this car, it was going to be done, it was going to be mine. So how's it been? What's it turned out like? Well, fantastic. In that first year, I put 10,000 miles on the clock of this car. It really is a usable car. Okay, there are still some Ferrari quirks about it. To get into the boot, you have to press the button here. To get the fuel flap open, you have to have the ignition on. But, it still moves and it steers beautifully. I was genuinely worried about this car's place on the driveway because it has been costing me a lot of money. The most recent bill was for about 10 or 12,000 pounds. If you wanna know how I spent that much money on a car like this, uh, check the video out. But it had been away for nine months in a row. I had not driven it at all in 2022 until about well, eight weeks ago. And in that time, I'd driven a number of other Ferraris, 599s, 360s, 430s, all sorts. I bought my 430 Scuderia and I'd bought the F12. A lot of people, the minute I got the F12, said, oh, you're gonna sell the 550 then? And I'd always said, well, no, not really. They're, they're very, very different things. But at the back of my mind was this sort of niggling thought going, James, you're gonna buy the newer car, it's probably gonna be much faster, even better to drive, even better to live with, likely cost you less to run because it's newer, and uh, I think the 550 is gonna just languish at the back of the driveway not being driven, and that's not a situation I want any car to be in, particularly one like this, because, um, well, they won't appreciate it, that's for sure. It didn't help that we had at least one false start where I went to go and pick the car up and then about 100 yards later I realised that there was still something that it needed doing and we've had a similar thing recently. It was home for about a month or so. I know in YouTube terms it's going to feel like it arrived with a load of issues but that wasn't actually what happened. The reason it's going back, by the way, is that the alarm system is playing up. And as it currently lives outside I really need that to work. So um, it was going off when it wasn't supposed to. Now it's not going off when it is supposed to. The locks kind of don't really work anymore. You've got to use the key, which I don't like doing. And um, yeah, it's a 1990s alarm system. This is not really a Ferrari thing. This is just kind of what happens with old 90s cars. 80s cars are worse for it, sure, but um, 90s cars aren't brilliant. I had an old Porsche once and that was no different things I do consider Ferrari problems, the sticky switches, which I have been meaning to sort for absolutely ages, the stereo I need to muck around with and work out what I'm going to do. There's a few little cosmetic bits that I want to tidy up, a couple of creaks and rattles, but by and large, the car has been good to me. And one thing I will say, though it has given me a few issues in the past, it has never, ever failed to proceed. And I have done, in the time that I've had this car, just over 12,000 miles. More impressively, perhaps, was the fact that 10,000 of those were done in the first year. I drove the heck out of this car, and I love driving this car, because that first time you jump into it, 
do you realise? The visibility is amazing. Sat next to each other on the driveway, the F12 and 550 don't look massively different in terms of width, but from in here, they feel night and day different. This I can drive around anywhere just about fine. The F12 is terrifying. Some of these roads, the F12s are like, ah, ah, help. The 430 is a lot better because it's mid-engined and also a reasonably small car, but that is a very different kettle of fish. All of the controls in this are pretty much perfectly weighted. The steering is absolutely beautiful, talks and communicates to you in a way that very, very few cars do, even stuff like the F12. I've worked out what the squeak is, by the way, it's the handbrake, so I'm going to get them to tend to that. The accelerator pedal, a lot of people complain about being really, really heavy, but it's an old school cable throttle. The response is perfect. The brakes are brilliant. The clutch, yeah, really heavy, but delightful. And that gear shift, that noise, that. Every time you change gear, and heel and toe in here is really easy as well, by the way. It's brilliant. And the ride quality, this is a comfortable car, a genuinely comfortable car, as is really the F12 and to some extent the 430 though, less so. But it's a real proper GT. You can do long distances in it. It has plenty of boot space. I have done big trips in it. It's wonderful. And it's still more than quick enough. One of the other things I really love about this car, the horn, it's really sweet. My favourite Ferrari quirk of this car I discovered after about three or four days of owning it. I went out for a trip and I came back in absolute agony. My back was killing me and I couldn't work out what was going on. I'd driven the car for a big long journey home, 250 miles, and I was fine. It was really comfy. And I was so worried because if I can't solve this problem, I will just have to sell the car. It's a big comfy GT car. If it's not comfy, I can't be doing with it. And then I realised that where Ferrari put the handbrake in the position that I drive the car, when I put it on, it just lifts one of the seat controls and puts the lumber on. The handbrake itself also is in a stupid position, a bit too far away for you to be able to get to. About 4,500 RPM, the thing opens up, it comes alive. But at all RPM, it has more than adequate shove. Lovely thing, this. Such a good engine. Though its extracurricular activities have certainly been very, very expensive, all of the regular maintenance on this car has actually turned out to be as cheap as I'd hoped. So a big major belt service for this is less than £2,000. It's about 1700 quid. A regular service, quite a bit less than that. The tyres, though they were tricky to find a matching set, again, about £900 for the whole car. Discs and pads all round, 1500 quid. That's less than one disc on each of the others. And, something I did not expect, it's also the best of all my Ferraris on fuel. That is every bit as daft a statement as you might imagine, by the way. I recorded on a long journey up to Scotland that this car could achieve on the motorway 22 to the gallon. On the exact same journey, at the exact same speed, the 430 Scuderia did 20 to the gallon. I really did think that might have been better. And the F12 did 15 and a half. This also has the largest fuel tank of all three. Ferrari claim 114 litres, though it's pretty well regarded that that is not accurate. Of all numbers for Ferrari to exaggerate, why they would exaggerate the fuel tank size, I do not know. Realistically though, it's still big, and we think 105 litres is likely more accurate. That's the number quoted for a 575, which is a facelift of the same thing, and you can get just over 100 litres in here if the thing is bone dry. The heater and aircon both work really well, and I think one of the things that really does appeal to me about the 550 is the relative lack of driver aids. So you do have the ASR, anti-slip regulation, which is um, a very, very primitive traction control. You've got ABS, and that's it. It is a car with lots and lots of power, lots and lots of torque, and there are places where you would put your foot down in a 355 just fine that you wouldn't in here. It's a semi-damp day out today and it's reasonably cold. Even in third gear, you have to be careful with this thing. It will want to break loose. Not in a particularly scary way usually, and the traction control does intervene, but um, you respect it. And it means that when you begin to have fun and want to play on a road, you realize that if you get it right, it's all about you 
and the car. With things like the 430 and certainly the F12, you'll put your foot down knowing you've asked a bit too much, but also knowing that the car will rein it into the precise amount required. It's very fun and very exciting in its own way, but here, that doesn't happen. You'll only ever ask of it what you're confident it can give or you're confident you can deal with should that be a bit too much for the chassis. That would probably sound quite scary to a lot of people, but the truth is, the car talks to you so much, it really isn't. Many times I've thought about buying another car of some description, an Aston, things like that, and then I realised that I have this, and in so many ways, it's just the perfect car for me as a day-to-day -day thing. On any day that I can drive this, lately, I have been, because I still love it. The title of this video is a classic Ferrari V12, expectation versus reality. I suppose a lot of it has met expectation. It's gonna be expensive to own and to run and all that jazz, but it has in so, so many ways exceeded them as well. It's much better to drive than I thought it was going to be. It's much more usable than I thought it was going to be. More of the year too. I've driven this recently in some pretty pants conditions and it was fine. If anything, I think I'm unnecessarily scared of it because when I bought it, one of the things that did need changing were the tires. They weren't horrible, they were Bridgestones, but they were just about five or six years old and in the dry, they were okay. In the wet, they were terrifying. I thought I was gonna crash this car into a lorry at a roundabout because he was going right, hadn't indicated so, and um, when I turned, the back of the car just broke away at 15 mile an hour. I wasn't doing anything silly, it wasn't even on the throttle, but it just slid sideways and I thought it was gonna go into him and uh, that would have been difficult to explain. Honestly, officer, I know I was in my Ferrari and the back end broke away, but it did just do it on its own. Oh uh, yes, unlikely story here, uh, get in the truck. Mind those stairs. And I love the fact that it surprises people. That I think is the best bit about owning this car. Expectation versus reality. What does everyone else expect? Well, it's a Ferrari. They think it's gonna be some hardcore, stripped out, shouty loud thing. Why, I don't know, but that seems to be the expectation. Everyone that I've taken out in this has said, wow, it's really comfortable. It's really nice. It's a lovely thing to be in. Yeah, it is. It's a GT car. That's what it was for. And I perhaps appreciate the somewhat weird, I know, link between this and my Lotus Evora for exactly that reason. Everyone has in their head the idea of what a Lotus is, but what they're actually thinking of is an Elise. And truth be told, they tend to get that wrong as well. And this is like that for Ferrari. I hope maybe that in some small way, the videos that I've made on this car have helped reignite a bit of appreciation for it. I was delighted to see Henry Catchpole drive one and also to see that he fell for it in the same way that I have for this. I know that Harry Metcalf, Richard Hammond, lots of people out there love the 550, but for some reason, it just isn't the car people think of when they think Ferrari. However, for me, I think now it's always going to be Will this car be around forever? No, probably not, because I am a realist. I would like it to be around forever, but that may not happen. However, I will always remember it. So worried was I, so, so worried that I get into this and just find it to be there. There are so many cars where you start driving them day to day and you, you get used to them, regardless of their quirks and features or failures. And I thought this was gonna be one of those. I thought, you know, I had a year where I drove as a daily this, and I get used to it, you get used to its oddities, but I worried that having experienced the newer ones, you're gonna go back to the old way and go, oh. You know when you go back to your old favorite pub from being a kid and you realize that actually it was terrible and you had no taste as a child? I thought that's what this was gonna be like. No, it's delightful, it's wonderful. The view out is amazing, people love it. Car fans love it because they know what it is and non-car fans love it because they appreciate that it's a classic. They know that it's something a little bit old and unusual and a little bit different. It represents a very different kind of Ferrari. Yeah, sure, stuff like the exhaust being super quiet is annoying, but this car exudes class. Though it 
may no longer be the best handling car in the world ever, it's still not a bad handling one. You can chuck this thing around a bend in a way you really shouldn't be able to a 1.75 ton front-engined V12. It thinks it's a hot hatch on occasion, this. Quite incredible. The drive-by shots you've been seeing today, the ones with the fog, the mist, the moody ones, well, my friend Antti and I filmed those a little while ago, and it should tell you everything you need to know about this car, that he's driven it very, very rarely, and felt confident enough to put his foot down in those conditions, and it looked amazing. Absolutely amazing. So svelte, so lithe. A few people, including St. Clarkson himself, drew unfavorable comparisons between the looks of this and the Toyota Supra, though I know he later recanted his wicked words. Even Henry Catchpole, who for the first time the other day got to drive one of these. Oh, and by the way, if you're watching Henry and you'd like to borrow one for a longer journey, this one is available. But Henry didn't like the fact that it had the bonnet scoop in the front. I love that. I think it looks awesome. And it's functional. It's what I love about this era of car. I love that the dials up here all tell me an accurate picture. Or other than the time, that one's wrong. And uh, sadly, the fuel gauge is not wrong. The temperature gauge, to give you an example, it's cold. It's about four or five degrees out there and I'm not driving particularly hard. So the gauges are here. On a motorway, on the hottest day of the year, when you're stuck in traffic, they're over here. They move because the engine gets hotter and colder and they trusted people to know what to do with that information. It's from a different time, this car. I think it's fair to say that the styling of the 550 is deliberately understated, all in keeping with Luca de Montezemolo's goal of creating the ultimate GT. What this car possesses is elegance versus the theatre of the mid-engined and later cars. That being said, I think it has the greatest rear of all time. Utterly simple, with a beautiful flick on the boot lid, giving it a touch of aggression, the trademark quad lamps echoed by quad exhausts, and nothing more. It's perfection. My own car has also recently been photographed, along with the F12 and 430, for a book by photographer Rudolf van der Ven. Having the car immortalised in such a way is really quite special for me, and only adds to the attachment I have to it. I can take as many photos of it as I like, but to have it featured in someone else's work I consider a great honour. A link for the book will be in the description down below. This really was a bold new step for Ferrari. They designed it to be cheaper and easier to maintain than a 456, and yeah, sure, this car has cost me a lot more than I hoped that it would, I console myself with the fact that a lot of the work that I've done is work that won't have to be done again, and I admit that that's man maths, and I'm lucky enough to say that because of the job that I do, my car actually can contribute towards its running costs. The last video I did saying how expensive it was to fix, well, that paid for the work that's about to be done to it. I'm very, very lucky in that way. Thank you for tuning in. And thank you for listening to this video in particular, because as you can probably tell, I am fighting a chest infection, which is not very fun. For some reason, the 550 Maranello remains a really criminally underappreciated car. And I don't know why, because it has all the things that people say they want in a Ferrari. A classic, beautiful, leather-lined interior with loads of gauges and things. That famous six-speed gated shifter, and here it's a pretty good one once it's warm. Excellent handling and steering feel. A thunderous power plant of an engine up front. Looks that combine the old and the new. And all in a package here that's actually somewhat understated, meaning people won't hate you so much for having it. It's not lost any money, and if I were to sell this, I probably would recoup some of what I've spent on it, but far from all. What I've always said is, make sure you're happy with the price you pay when you get the car, and I believe I paid a fair price for this, and that way you won't feel embittered, like you've been done, you've been had, and more importantly, if the values do double, great, you've got your dream car and you've made some money, and if they halve, yeah, you've lost some money, but you've got your dream car. And this is that. So, thanks to you all for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.